Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 23. We're going to start with verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Kiara, and they robbed the threshing floors, meaning the grain. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Kiara. Now David, in the last few verses, has, he's been doing what he wanted to do. Now he's turning back to the Lord, and he says, he says, What? He, he's speaking to the Lord and he says, what do you want me to do? And that's the way we should be in our walk with the Lord. Every day of our life we should ask, well, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want me to do? In Psalms 40, verse 8, and David wrote most of the Psalms. It says, I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, the law is within my heart. Now, how do we know what God's will is if we don't study the Word? Many Christians don't study the Word of God. So how are they going to know what God's will is for them if they don't study? We can't say that. If we're not a studier, if we're not a studier of the Word of God, we can't say, I want your will done, Father, because we don't know what His will is. We don't know the Father. It's not in our heart. In Psalms 143, verse 10, it says, Teach me to do Thy will. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good, lead me into the land of uprighteousness. Like I said, how many of us can say that? We can only say that if we know what God's word is. God can only, he speaks through us through his words. And that's why I use a lot of scriptures when I'm teaching. Because we want to hear from the Lord, we don't want to hear from Jesse. We want to hear from the Lord. And this is the way we grow, and this is how we can say, Oh, Lord, I want your will to be done. That's in my heart. It's for your will to be done in my life. Because when I gave you my life, I made you Lord of my life. I got off the throne, and I put you there. Now I live for you. I don't live for myself. I live for you, Lord. And that's the way, that's how David is. In verse 3, And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Kiara against the enemies of the Philistines? Now David's men were afraid because of two reasons here. The first reason was Judah was very close to where they were at. And King Saul is still after David. And King Saul is going to kill anyone who's helping David. So they were, they were afraid of King Saul because he was near. And the second reason, David and his army is just a few men. Well, not a few, it's 600 men. But they're going against the armies of the Philistines, which was much, much bigger. So there were two reasons why they were, they were afraid. And in verse 4, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Kiara, for I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. Now the Lord didn't ask, uh, David didn't ask the Lord for himself, because God had already told David to go and smite them. God already told David. David had the same faith he had when he went up against Goliath. He knew God was going to be with him. So David was already, he was ready to go up against the Philistines because God said go, told him to go. And just like the Lord has had told, he's told us. He's told us to go out and, and tell people about him. He's told us to go be witnesses, to go tell people about Jesus and salvation. He's told us to go, just like he told David to go. He's going to be with it. He's going to, we're going to see he's going to be with David. He was with David when he fought the giant. He's going to be with David here. And just like he says go, he's telling us. But we're looking at it a different kind of way. He's telling us to go tell people about him. Now we have to believe. We have to believe that God is going to be with us when we go out there. Believe me. Like I said before, Satan will give you a hundred thousand excuses why not to tell people about the Lord. It's up to us if we listen to him or not. God has already told us, if you're a born-again Christian, he has given every Christian the ministry of reconciliation, telling the loss about him. So just like he told David right here to go, he has told us to go also. And we need to obey. Are we willing to obey? Are we willing to obey God and whatever he tells us to do? We need to be. We need to be. And then, now, some of this obeying is kind of rough. And I'm going to show you, like husbands, the Lord has told us, He's commanded us. He says, love your wife as Christ loved the church. 
That's what he told us, the men, the husbands. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Christ died for the church. Christ forgives the church constantly because church is run by men and we're not perfect. So men, husbands, we're supposed to love our wives that way. We're supposed to almost see them faultless. And it says, wives, submit to your husbands as on to the Lord. Now these are commands from the Lord. These are commands. He said, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as on to the Lord. Wives, if you're not obeying your husband, submitting to him, then you're not submitting to the Lord either. Because he says, do it as unto the Lord. So he says, he's saying, as you listen to me, listen to your husband. Submit to your husband. This is a command. Some of these commands, they're hard if we're not walking in the Spirit. Let me put it this way. If you're not walking in the Spirit, these commands are hard to do. But if you're walking with the Lord, these commandments, they're not hard. It's a, he says in Matthews, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. He's, it's a command from God. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. He says, I got tomorrow. I'll take care of tomorrow. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. That's, that's in the Word. It's in Matthews. It's a command. So he's got a lot of commands. And a lot of us take them as hard. As hard to follow. But like I said, if you're walking with the Lord as we see David... When he's walking with the Lord, he does what God says. And he has victory. Amen? Amen? He has victory when he's obeying God. David didn't inquire to the Lord about going to fight the Philistines for himself. He inquired again, but he did it for his men. Because his men were afraid. So because of his men, the Lord David went to the Lord and prayed again. You know, is this what you want me to do? And... People like husbands, husbands, if, if the Lord tells us to do something and our wife is worried about it and she's, she's not too sure about it, pray to the Lord again for her assurance. Pray for her that she'll see that, okay, he's praying to God again. And if he says the same thing, then I got to rest in it. I, I need to have peace in it. But husbands, if the, the Lord tells us something, we hear him, we obey. But if the wife has a problem with it, we'll go to the Lord again for her. Just like David did it for his men. David didn't do it for himself. David was already going to go. But his men were scared. So David went to the Lord a second time. And prayed again for his men. And that's what we should do. If someone's, has, if someone's worried about something. Someone that's under us. Then we go to the Lord. Even though we've got the message. We got the word. But if there's someone underneath us. That's not sure. Then go to the Lord again. Pray again. Just to give that person the assurance that you've heard from God. In verse 2, God just said, go. He told David, go. Now he's saying, what he's saying here in this verse is pretty much what he's saying is, get up, get up off your honey and go. That's what he's saying. And he added a little insurance this time when he said it. He said, I will. God said, I will deliver the Philistines. This is God. God said, I will. Right. How many of us believe God when he tells us he will do something? We need, we need to believe that. When God says He will, there's places in the Bible says, and God says, I will. I take it to heart. I believe Him 100%. And one of them that I believe, and I love it, and believe me, I, I love this verse. It's because He said, I will. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to, to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. He said, I will. He said, I, I will come for you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. And what is he going to come to us for? To take us to a mansion in heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> I mean, we keep these verses in our head. We, we should walk a glorious walk. We should, we should always have a smile on our face. Because God, I mean, this is God telling us, He's saying, I will come for you. And I'm going to take you to that mansion in the heaven. Amen. We need to keep this in our minds. You know, God said to meditate on them day and night. Well, that's what He's talking about. Meditate on that. Say, and it'll help you through the day, knowing, hey, this down here is just temporary. We're not here forever. 
We're going to be with Jesus in heaven forever. That's Amen. forever. Amen? Amen. Verse 5. So David and his men went to Kiara and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smoked them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Kiara. Again, I say, we need to trust God when he tells us something. He told David, go, and then he will deliver the Philistines to him. It says right here that he slaughtered the Philistines. I, I've said this over and over, but I, I, just, I always have to say it. Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. This is the Lord speaking. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So the way we do things and the way God does things, they're totally different. God's ways are perfect. So when we look at something and think we should, well, it should be done this way, but God has another way and we're like, oh, I don't think that's going to work. Eh, we're messing up. God's way is perfect. His ways are not our ways. And the way we know His ways, again, we need to study His words. Think about it. These men risked their lives to obey God. They obeyed Him. They went. And they, they felt they were risking their life. But of course, God saw them through it. But there's, there's Christians in other countries, right? Today, in other countries, they do have to be feared being killed for the Lord. We, don't, we have the freedom down here to have Bible study. We have the freedom down here to worship our God. In other countries, they don't. Now, they do, they do have to fear being killed. But if God put them there, if God put them there, they're protected. And maybe, and maybe they will be crucified. Just like Stephen. Stephen's walked with God. Walked with God and he was stoned to death. But he was in God's will. There's things like that, you know, you read the Bible and you're like, why did God let that happen? Well, it was God's will. God's will is God's will. Okay, a lot of times, a lot of times we do not understand it. But it's God's will. And the more we know our Father, the more we understand the things He does. But He, he does say, there's going to be times we don't understand why He did it or didn't do it. So I'm sure some of you are thinking, yes, he delivered the Philistines, but how many of, of the men were going to die? When the Lord sends an army of Israel out to battle, if you read the Bible, it, there weren't, none of them died. They'd go into battle, and only the enemy would be slaughtered, just like here. When the Lord sent the army of Israel, they had to have faith that God was going to be with them. And that's just that's the same thing with us. We have we have to have faith that God is walking with us, that we're walking with the Lord whenever we go through our every whatever it is out there we go through at work, whatever it is, we have to believe that God is with us. Because remember, there's very few of us. This whole world, God said, broad is the gate to hell. That means a lot of people are not making it to heaven. Narrow is the gate to heaven. So there's going to be only very few Christian born again Christians. So if you look at it, man, we got a whole world we're up against. Yeah? But who's with us? Amen? Amen. He's with us. <laughs> I believe it. And I stand on that. And when God does something, He does it right. He does it right. You know, I used to be a smoker when I was lost. And I tried to quit smoking. Oh, I don't know how many times I tried to quit smoking. It was a habit that I could not stop. As soon as I gave my life to the Lord... That was my first prayer to him was, Lord, please take these cigarettes away. Within one week, they were gone. Did I gain weight? Did he replace the cigarettes with something else? No, when God heals you, he heals you completely. He don't give you another habit to take on. You know, when you're doing it on your own or you're depending on a patch or whatever. No, when you go to the Lord and he heals you from whatever it is, like with me it was smoking, he takes it away. And he doesn't replace it with another habit. God does things right. Amen. Amen. And verse 6. And it came to pass when Ab Abathor, the son of Elimelech, fled to David to Kirara, that he came down with an ephrob in his hand. Now, ephrob is a priestly piece of garment like an apron. They would wear it when they were seeking 
uh, a word from the Lord, a divine guidance from the Lord. That's what they did back then. You know, Jews had a lot of customs. They did traditions. But today, we don't live by traditions. Today, we don't need an ephrob. Today, we have Jesus. He will guide us. He guides us. When you seek Jesus, He will guide you in whatever it is you're looking guidance for. Like I said, this was a religious tradition they did back then. And remember, it was the religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross. Just thought I'd throw that in there. We need the Word of God. We don't need religion. We need the words of God. That's what we need. Verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Kiara, and Saul said, God, God hath delivered him into my hands, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. Now Saul has not been walking with the Lord as in, in the teachings we've had. Saul is totally away from the Lord. But because they, he sees David is trapped, Saul is saying, God has delivered him into my hands. This is what Saul wanted. You know, there's times when we we do we see something that's good or something good happens to us and it is something that we like, we right away we think it's from the Lord. Or vice versa, if something bad happens, you know, why did God do that? We we have to learn when you're walking with the Lord, good things and bad things happen. He's Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's always going to be, he's always going to have it good on us. The difference between us and lost people is we have the Lord to go through whatever we have to go through. Because he says it rains on the just and the unjust. So whatever happens to the lost people, it's going to happen to us too. But we have the Lord to stand with. He, he lifts us up. We make it through whatever it is because of him. Saul so, so is doing what many of us do. Christians. If someone wants to go on a ministry like they want to go to another country, whatever country it may be, if that's what they want to do, they'll say, God told me to go. Well, there's many times I've seen people who said that, and the way they did it, I know God didn't tell them. But when someone wants some, if someone wants to do something, they say, God told me to. So that way nobody will argue with them. I mean, who's gonna, if they say, God told me, who's going to argue with you? But a lot of times they use God's name in vain. And that's what, using God's name in vain, that's what it is. It's when you use his name and he's not the one that told you. But a lot of times we do that. Just like Saul here. Saul saying, he delivered me into, he delivered David into my hand. No, he didn't. Verse 8. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Kiara to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abinathor, the priest, bring hither the ephrod. Now, David wanted the ephrod, because like I said, back then they used it as God just giving them the divine guidance. And so David again is looking to the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, they, like I said, David's life with, with God is this. It's a roller coaster. One minute, he's, he wants, you know, what God, God, what do you want me to do? He goes directly to the Lord and says, what do you want me to do? And he listens. He obeys. But then there's times he gets in the flesh and he does what he thinks he should do. Again, again, David goes to God and finds out what God wants him to do. In verse 10, Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Kiara to destroy the city for my sake. Now, if David was still in the flesh, they would say, Saul's coming to kill me. He would have been thinking of himself. But right here is showing David is not, David's walking with the Lord now. So right now he's worried about the people in the city. That's what he says. To destroy the city for my sake. He, he's worried about the people in the city. He's not worried about himself. Saul's been trying to kill David. So right here David could have easily said, oh, he's coming to kill me. But that's not what he thought of. He thought of the people that were in the city around him. In verse 11, Will the men of Kiriara deliver me up into his hands? This is David asking the Lord. Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard, O Lord God of Israel? 
I beseech thee, tell my servant, tell thy, my, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Kiara deliver me and my men into the hands of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Now, David has just saved Kiara from the Philistines. He just saved them from being defeated by the Philistines. So he's, he's like their savior. Not spiritual savior, but you understand what I'm saying? He's like their savior. And they're getting ready to turn against him. He saved them from the Philistines, and they're getting ready to turn against him. This reminds me of the tribulation. Those of us who know about the seven-year tribulation, if you take the mark of the beast, you'll be beheaded. If you say, no, I'm a Christian, I live for the Lord, and you don't, you don't bow down to the Antichrist, you will be beheaded. That's what the Bible says. But then there's going to be those who are going to give in and say, oh, no. Like Peter said when they arrested Jesus, oh, I didn't know him just to save themselves. You see what I'm saying? That's what these people did. They're saving themselves. Even though David has just saved them for the Philistines, Saul's going to come down they're going to say, oh, he's here or he's there. They're giving David up. Now, we don't want to be that way. If we ever come to the point, which I hope we don't, but if we ever come to a point where we might be prosecuted for being believers, I would pray that, that we would stay with the Lord and not turn against them. Because like I said, this place is only temporary. As soon as, as soon as you stop breathing, the second you stop breathing, you're with the Lord. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, death, I mean, I'm, I'm scared to stop breathing. You know, I'm, I'm scared to die. But I know what's going to happen as the second I do die. But I just scared to stop breathing. That I don't think, you know, I'm not going to be smaller when I'm not breathing. But anyway, <laughs> I'll be happy that I'm going to be with the Lord the second I the second I stop breathing. I'm with the Lord. So my my Savior. This is this was David. David, David was their Savior. They turned him in. I pray to God that I don't ever turn in my Savior, and say no, I didn't know him. And don't say you'll never do it, because I'm sure Peter didn't think he would do it. But when the time got tough. He did deny the Christ. He did deny the Christ. So I just pray I won't ever do. It. I, I mean, I I wish I could stand up and say, "Oh, I would never do that." I don't know when the situation comes up. We don't know until it happens. But I would pray I would be strong enough to say, "Yes, I'm a believer." Amen. Mm -hmm. Verse thirteen. Then David and his men, which were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Kiara, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that they was escaped from Kiara and he forbear to go forth. Now David's army has grown. He started off with just a few men. This, in the other lessons where he asked for five loaves from the priest. Well five loaves can feed about five men. Don't feed very many. But now he's, now he's up to 600 men. And this is after going into battle. He's gone into battle with these men, and he still his men, his his army has grown. It's not getting smaller because of these battles he's been in. His army is growing. When Saul heard David had left, he didn't go after him. At this point, Saul heard David had left, and Saul did not go after him. Somehow, some way, David escaped, escaped Saul again. Well, being a Christian, I don't say somehow, some way this. No. If it didn't happen, I know why it didn't happen. It was the Lord. You know, people who don't know the Lord, they'll go, I don't know, I, somehow, some way, I got out of it or whatever. Christians, no, we know it was God that's, that protected us. In verse 14, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, and remained in the mountain in the wilderness of Sib, and Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hands. God did not let Saul have David. David is a man of God. David is Christian. He is up and down as far as walking with the Lord. But David is protecting. Not, not because he's David. But because David is one of his just like us. We belong to God. We're his children. Just like David was a child of God. So are we. And just like he protects David. He will protect us. We gotta believe that. 
So I'll be in a full thought that thought God was with him. Remember he says back in verse 7, God has delivered him into my hands. Well, he didn't. That was, that was a good thing to happen to Saul, but good things happen in life. It doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. And I'm showing you that right here. Saul thought this was from the Lord, but it wasn't. It was a good thing for Saul, but it wasn't from God. Verse 15, And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Zip in the wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood, and strengthened his hand in God. So Jonathan, this is, remember, in the teaching before, I showed where Jonathan and David was blood, they had a blood covenant between man and man. Remember I taught that? So Jonathan is going to, to encourage David, because this is his blood brother, a covenant brother. He's going to encourage David, because he knows he's, you know, David, he's been running and running and running. So, and David and Jonathan, I'm sure he had a hard time with this, because Jonathan, his daddy, is king, Saul. That's his father. But then he's got David, his blood covenant brother, you know, who do I choose? Well, I'm sure he couldn't choose. That's why God intervened and said and told told him, go talk to David. Go in, ter, encourage David. This is why we need to stay close to the Lord. So we can hear him in times like this when we're not sure what to do. I mean, we, we got this over here, but then we got this too, and it's hard to make a choice. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. He will give you an answer. He will show you which way to go or, or whatever it is that you need help with. I don't know, but the commentaries, the commentaries that I read, uh, David was out in the woods for two years. And that's a long time when you're waiting on hearing from the Lord. Many of us, many of us, we can't wait that long. If we're seeking the Lord for our next move, whatever it may be, and if it takes too long, what do we do? We get ahead of Him. We don't wait for him to tell us. We get ahead of him. So I'm sure he sent Jonathan here to help David. Because David's been in the wilderness, in the woods for two years, waiting. So God sent Jonathan, his brother, to, re to, to encourage him. Hey, I'm still here. I'm still with you. There's a timetable. There's a t God has a timetable. We don't know what it is. It might be quick or it might take a long time. We don't know. But we need to wait on God. We need to learn to wait on God. If you don't hear from the Lord, don't do anything. Don't do anything. And when He does speak to you, you'll know. So He gives He gives David a word from God to encourage him to stay strong. And that, like I said, that's where we make mistakes. We don't wait. Verse 17, And He said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul, my father, knoweth. Jonathan is saying this is because, he's saying this to David because it's been prophesied by Samuel, the prophet, that David was going to be king. So he's encouraging David, remember, you, it's been prophesied, you're going to be king. I hear people telling others, like when they're sick, now, Jonathan heard from God to tell David these things. Now, I'm going to put this in there because I see it all the time. Someone who is sick, a person will go up to them and say, everything's going to be okay. Well, if I'm sick and someone comes up to me and tells me, hey, everything's going to be okay, I'm going to ask them. I'm going to say, hey, did God tell you that? Because if God told you, I'm going to be I'm gonna be on cloud nine. I'm going to be happy. <laughs> But if this person is just saying it to be nice, you know, it might not be okay. God might not heal me. And here I am thinking everything will be okay because this brother, family, whoever it may be, preacher, said, hey, everything's going to be okay. And unless, unless God tells you to tell that person that, there's other ways to comfort, to comfort them without, I hate to say this, but without lying to them. Because if you haven't heard from God, don't tell them that. Hope you understand what I'm trying to say there. Jonathan tells David, I shall be with you. Jonathan is telling David the same thing Jesus has told us. 
Hebrews 13 5 Jesus said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee just like David and Jonathan were blood brothers blood brothers we have the blood of Jesus over us and Jesus says I will never leave you and I will never forsake you now I don't know if y'all know it or not but you it's okay if you want to holler amen or praise the Lord or anything I mean if you're excited inside that's good but if you want to show it it's okay it's all right I know we go to the Baptist church but you know you can get excited I mean it's okay I've been in a church before where there was a lady in front of me it was a Pentecostal church and she was in front of me and she's just praising the Lord got her hands all up in the air you know praising the Lord but they had a door over here and a door over here and every time them doors were open she would look she'd keep her hands waving but she'd be looking Man, you know if it's in the flesh don't do it don't do it because everybody else is doing it but if the spirit moves you to get excited and to do whatever if the spirit leads you it's okay in this place because I'm not going to ask you to quench the spirit it's biblical do not quench the spirit the, uh, verse 18 and they too made a covenant before the Lord and David abode in the wood and Jonathan went to his house now what they did was they renewed their vows again before the Lord and that's very important to God when, you're make, when you get married and you say your vows now if you're just repeating the preacher or whoever it is if you're just repeating what he's saying that's really not coming from you that's really not vowing making a vow to your spouse to the Lord the Lord is being your witness when you make a vow and, it's, and, the, and you're doing it in front of God you better take that very seriously Jonathan Dave, and David did they were blood brothers and when they made that vow they were making it to God I will be there for him for whenever for whatever and vice versa so when you make vows before the Lord it would be best if we keep them because we're talking about God we're not just talking uh, just doing it as a ceremony in a, in a wedding or something you better mean what you say if you're making the vows in front of God you understand what I'm saying now let's drop down to verse 26 and Saul went on this side of the mountain and David and his men on that side of the mountain and David made haste to get away for fear of Saul for Saul and his men compassed David and his men are round about to take them Saul has caught up with David and they have him surrounded that's what this verse is saying they have him surrounded it doesn't look good for David and his men it, now look if you're looking with these eyes and you see that you're surrounded by an army of men that's much bigger than you and you're looking with these eyes what are you going to think I'm, that's it they're going to kill me but who's in control? David's walking with the Lord, so who's in control? Yeah. The Lord's in control. The Lord is walk with the Lord. Let him be in control. And you don't have you don't have to worry about how big it is out there, how big the problem is, or whatever it is. That's one thing I'm trying to push over and over. I don't care how big the problem is. If God is your savior and you're walking with him, he says, Don't worry about it. Amen. Don't you know how much people get depressed, they get ulcers. Why? Because they worry. They work. God said, don't worry about it. I got it. Amen. Amen? Yeah, yeah. Believe the Word of God, okay? When you become a Christian, take the Word of God. And, and I, this is what I said to myself. When I became a Christian, I said, this Bible right here, I'm going to believe everything in this. Everything. I'm not going to choose what I like and what I don't like. Like some people do. Oh, I'm going to obey that. Obey that, but... Mm, that I'm not going to obey. That's not being a Christian. That's not walking with the Lord. When you're walking with the Lord, it says in, in, in Amos 3.3, 3, it says, How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? God says, unless you're in agreement with me, we can't walk together. Alright? So that's why I say, I believe everything in the Word of God. Everything. I'm not going to choose what scriptures I want to believe and which ones I don't want to believe. But David is surrounded, his men are surrounded, but remember, God is in control. Verse 27, But there came a message unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Remember, Saul's king, 
and that's his land they're invading. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called the place Shelah Hamalegoth, which means the rock of escape. I'm showing you these verses because God's ways are not our ways. I mean, we would have thought that was it for us if we were surrounded by an army. We would have thought that was it. But it wasn't. And now God's going to use them to save David from Saul. God is going to use the Philistines. That What did David do? He slaughtered the Philistines. Slaughtered them. Just a few verses ahead. Now, God is using those Philistines to save David. Did you see that? So, you know, God does things the way we don't think about doing them. Look, oh, I just wiped out those people over there. Now they're going to come save me? No, I don't think I'm going to be thinking that way. But that's what happened. David slaughtered the Philistines, and then God used the Philistines to get Saul away from David. <laughs> Do we see it? Praise God. Eh? My father, he's something else. <laughs> now, David wasn't expecting God to answer his prayer that way, okay? In 1 Samuel verse uh, chapter 17, verse 47, it says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword, with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Did the Lord use any kind of weapon to save David at that time? Mm -hmm. No, he just made something happen over there to save David over here. He didn't use an army. He didn't use a spear or sword. He did it by words. The battle is the Lord's. We gotta remember that. Second Chronicles ten fifteen. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Can we remember that? Can we remember that? We need to remember that. Be not dismayed by reason of this great multitude. Whatever it is out there that's big to you, whatever it is. No matter how big it is, it says, For the battle is not yours, but God's. Can we rest in that? Can we go to bed at night and go to sleep? Hmm. Not having to worry about this or that. Seriously. If you give it to the Lord, you can go to bed at night and just go to sleep. Christians can do that. Right. If you know how to give things to the Lord. He says, The battle's not yours, it's mine. Let me take care of it. Hmm. I think it would be right about here when David wrote, remember, David wrote most of the Psalms. I think right about here, David wrote Psalms 54. It says, Come with great power, O God, and rescue me. Defend me with your might. Listen to my prayer, O God. Pay attention to my plea, for strangers are, are attacking me. Violent people are trying to kill me. They're, they, they care nothing for God, but God is my helper. The Lord keeps me alive. May the evil plans of my enemies be turned against them. Now that verse right there, I have it. I made a teaching on when the enemy is attacking you, whatever the enemy is trying to attack you on, whatever they're trying to do, you, do to you, and I show you biblically, the Lord turns around and does it to them. Right. I've, I've done a teaching. It's, it's all through the Bible. The Lord turns it around and, and has it done to them. And it just says it right here also. And it says, Do as you promised and put an end to them. I will sacrifice a volunteer offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from my troubles and helped me in the triumph over my enemies. Do we have good scriptures to read? Are these good scriptures? Mm -hmm. If something's bothering you, or if you've got some kind of stress or, or about something... Go read these. You, you got the paper. That's why I give you these papers. So y'all can take them home and read them for yourself. Let them hit your heart. Your heart. Don't let them just go right here in the brain. Let them, let it, the verse hit you in your heart. So that way you can receive it and believe it. There's times when God doesn't answer a prayer. We think he doesn't answer it. But he does answer it. It might not be in our way, but he does answer prayer. Let God answer your prayer the way He wants to. And don't expect them to, to answer it the way you want it. Because then you're going to think, well, he didn't, he didn't answer my prayer. Well, no, He did. You just didn't see it. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. Verse 29. And David went up from thence 
and dwelt in the strongholds at Ejedi. Again, again, David is in the stronghold, waiting for the Lord for his next move. This is what he's going. The stronghold, what I taught last time, the stronghold is a place out in the wilderness where it's hard to find someone that's out there. So he's out in the stronghold, so Saul won't find him. Now we'll go to chapter 24, verse 1. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Ejedi. I'm pointing this verse out to show you that when we have victory in our lives, it doesn't necessarily mean it's from the Lord, just like Saul. Do you think the Lord was rewarding Saul by defeating the Philistines? No. That wasn't a reward to, to Saul because Saul is so far from what walking with the Lord, God is not going to bless him. He's so out of the will of God right now. Believe me, God did not bless Saul by defeating the Philistines, having him defeat the Philistines. Plus, he's trying to kill David. And who's David? David is anointed to be the king of Israel. So, so Saul is totally away from the Lord right now. Good things does not mean it's from God. We have preachers who have big, nice churches. They have many members. And they have success in their church. But they're really, really, they're living by the world's standards. They're not going to, their, their thing is positive thinking. They won't preach hell. That's bad. You know, they won't preach you were a sinner. There's a lot of churches out there, and they're big because the preacher's not offending them with the Word of God. Believe me, the Word of God offends because we don't know how to live. And when He shows us, a lot of times we're like, it offends us because this is the way we've been doing it. And, but then He shows us, hey, that's wrong. In fact, in the book of Luke chapter 4, if you read it, He went into the church, and He was preaching. And in that church, He stepped on their toes so badly they wanted to kill him. We're talking about Jesus. And he wasn't just some preacher maybe saying something that was wrong. We're talking about Jesus. He don't say nothing wrong. Because of his preaching, this church wanted to kill Jesus. You hear me? So when you belong to a real big church, don't take it that it's from God. Just because it's a real big church. Apparently this preacher, because when people get offended, they most time they want to leave the church. If the, if the preacher offends them, they want to leave. So if you're preaching the word of God, you're really not going to have a big church. You're really not. Jesus, back then, his churches was in homes, remember? They had, home, they had churches in homes, and they were small. So, I'm trying to show, because it looks good, that doesn't mean it's necessarily good. It doesn't mean it's from God. About the preachers who ask for money? If, you, if you're at a church and they're always asking for money, or if you just watch TV, uh, some preacher, and they're always asking for money, I'm not going to say they're not a Christian, but I will say they're not in the will of God. Because when God sends you out to preach or to teach, like me, I'm a teacher. My website, all this that I have, the computer, everything in that office, everything I have has come from God. I haven't ever asked anybody for any money. Y'all been coming to me for years. I've never asked y'all for money. The Lord supplies me what I need. Now, if a preacher is out there asking for money, apparently he's not in the will of God. Because God said, don't take nothing with you. He told his disciples to go out and preach. And he told them, he said, don't take anything with you. I will supply everything you need. That's when you know it's from God. Okay? But I'm just showing things. These, I'm just showing these things because everything that seems to be good doesn't necessarily mean it's from the Lord. Or on TV... We have a preacher on TV, and I'm not going to say the name of the, the, the show or anything, but toward the end, he's always, there's someone out there that has this or that that's sick. God told me he's going to heal you. You know, that's a joke. No, read your Bible. If you read your Bible, God does not work that way. He does not work that way. I mean, he's, there's somebody, no, if God was healing somebody out there, he's going to give you the name. Okay, he'll give you the name. He's not going to just say, there's somebody out there. Well, out of millions of people, surely somebody has whatever he's talking about. You know, okay? But there's, read the Word of God so you can see what's of God and what is not of the Lord. 
just because it looks good, sounds good, that doesn't mean it's from God. I hope you try. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Many times, we're blinded. We're blinded. We think that's good. Do you know why? Because we don't study His words. We don't study His words to know, hey, this is not right. That's not God's way. People who do not study the Word of God, and I praise God that you are here. Because this is a Tuesday night. This ain't Sunday. It's a Tuesday night. You've taken your time out to come hear the Word of God. Amen. Y'all have blessed my heart. Okay? Seriously. Y'all bless my heart. People who want to know the Word of God and grow in the Word of God, praise God. Praise God because you will be protected. Now you may ask, you know, why didn't the Lord just do away with Saul because, you know, he's done all this bad stuff. You know, he's trying to kill David and, and he's done all this bad stuff. Well, if God was to kill Saul, he'd have to kill us too because we're wicked also. You know, in God's eyes, sin is sin, right? There's no greater or lesser sins. Sin is just sin. So we say, God should have done away with them. Well, maybe you should have done away with us also because we're just, we're wicked also. In a different kind of way, but we're, we're, I hope nobody in here thinks they're perfect because we're not perfect until we go be with the Lord. Victory comes when you're walking with the Lord but you also can have victory when you're not walking with the Lord. Like I said. Now I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. In Romans 2.4 it says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? This is why the Lord has been so kind to, to, to Saul. He's given him chance after chance for him to repent of what he's doing. He does the same thing to us too. He warns us and he gives us he gives us opportunities to whatever we're doing, whatever sin we're in, he gives us opportunities to, to repent and to turn from that sin before he starts chastising us. Because the Lord does chastise us, chastise us. Believe me, I've been chastised. You don't want me to be chastised by the Lord. But he right here it says, Hey, I let it go, I let it go, showing you my kindness, showing you my, my uh my love for you, hoping that you'll see it and that you'll turn from your sin and go back to the Lord. And this is probably what's happening to Saul right here. That's probably what God is doing to Saul, hoping that Saul will repent. But we're going to see Saul's not.